Welcome to the Royal College of Psychiatrists. This short video showcases the work of the college's Spirituality Special Interest Group, which has over 3,000 psychiatrists as members. What made you feel it was important to start a Spirituality Special Interest Group for psychiatrists in the first place? Over the last hundred years, we've learned a great deal about the brain and a lot about the mind but we haven't given much time or thought to the human spirit. We are not just complex biological machines. We are conscious beings, we are self-aware, and we are always challenged by the big questions of life and death. Why am I here? What am I here for? What's the purpose and meaning of my life? What happens when I die? How do I make sense of suffering and loss? What gives me hope when I'm struggling with life? How can I give of my best? The answers can't be found in a textbook because they're very personal and very individual. We have to find our own answers to these spiritual questions. Spirituality is for everyone, not only for people who have religious belief. So it may be about God and all that lies beyond, or it may be about humanity, our family, our friends, our community, the natural world, the health of this planet. It's about what brings inspiration to the human spirit. Music, poetry, the arts, walking in nature, creativity of every kind, meditation, prayer, helping other people. Everything that connects us to the greater whole. So why did we start the spirituality group 15 years ago? Firstly, research, especially from the United States, was highlighting how spirituality and religion can play a positive role in improving physical and mental health. Next, surveys from uh, mental health users uh, showed that about half of our patients were turning to spirituality and religion to help them get through their crisis. But they didn't feel able to talk about this with their psychiatrist uh, or to share um, those beliefs and values as part of trying to work out in what way they could best be helped. Next, our profession needs to learn much more about the nature of spiritual crisis because this can lead to a misdiagnosis of mental illness although at times, of course, it can be part of mental illness. So we need to be able to distinguish between the two and to understand when they overlap. Next, we need to have a much better understanding of grieving and loss, of the near-death experience, of end-of-life experiences, and closer collaboration with chaplaincy of all denominations and with faith communities. Next, we need to make tactful inquiry into our patients' spiritual and religious beliefs and needs because this can influence how we're going to be able to help them best. And we know from many patients that they would welcome this kind of inquiry. Lastly, we need to support the development of spiritually informed therapies. The therapies that have been shown to work in the treatment of addiction and alcoholism and also with mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for the treatment of anxiety and depression. So, what have we achieved since we started 15 years ago? Spirituality is becoming recognized as an essential part of whole person healthcare. Material ambition and success cannot compensate for the inner life and spiritual values such as kindness, compassion, and caring for others. Now, the Royal College of Psychiatrists has been very supportive of our work. We have a website which is both for professionals and the general public, and which incidentally has about 200 papers written by psychiatrists on the subject of spirituality and mental health, which can be freely downloaded. We've also written a leaflet about spirituality and mental health for service users, which can be downloaded from the website. The college has approved and published uh, recommendations for psychiatrists on spirituality and religion, 
which is an important position statement made by the college. The college has already published one book on spirituality and psychiatry, and a second volume is going to be published shortly. There is much to be done, but uh, do take a look at our work. Just Google spirituality and psychiatry and you'll find our website. Why is it important for junior doctors to be aware of a patient's faith or spiritual values? When patients present to mental health services, they're often in quite significant distress. Uh, and so asking about spiritual values or uh, religious faith uh, shows that you uh, want to connect with them at a very personal and deep level and that you really care about what matters to them. Religious faith um, can affect the way a person will deal with the difficulties that they're facing uh, and in the long term uh, can be an important factor in helping them to recover. Religious faith is often protective against mental illness um, in the first place, um, but if someone does become unwell, um, using their religious faith or spiritual values can be an important part uh, of them uh, getting better. The other important issue is that of diagnostic uncertainty. A good example of this is religious delusions. When patients become unwell, they can sometimes present with new religious ideas, which are difficult to assess unless you know what's normal for them in the first place. Uh, sometimes it may be uh, the way that they are coping with uh, their difficulties, but in other cases it can be related to them developing a new uh, psychiatric symptom. And without knowing what's normal for them, it's very difficult to tell the difference. Why might junior doctors ignore spiritual issues in their patients? Some junior doctors may not think spirituality is relevant to their clinical assessment, and perhaps because they think of mental illness in quite a narrow way. They may often not take the whole person into account. And by ignoring spirituality, uh, they ignore the context in which someone presents with their difficulties. We are often told to think about uh, patients in a biological, psychological and social uh, aspects of care. But spirituality is an extra and very important area uh, which can aid the diagnostic process as well as um, being able to work out how to help patients. Junior doctors may themselves have negative attitudes towards religious faith or spirituality and this may make them feel embarrassed or uncomfortable when talking to patients about these issues. Having regular teaching for junior doctors on spirituality will help allay these fears and actually make them better clinicians when treating patients. Do service users want psychiatrists to be concerned with their religion or spiritual beliefs? Well, over 50% of service users have a religion or spiritual belief which they say is important to them. The problem is that for so many, their religion becomes all mixed up with their illness. Many have religious type experiences that psychiatrists would usually class as symptoms. However, they are no less real to the service user involved. And indeed, most psychiatrists would agree that many religious experiences are not pathological. Service users need help to have their experiences validated and not just to have the baby thrown out with the bathwater. They may need help to reject unhealthy aspects of their religious convictions while being facilitated in their search for religious well-being. Many will then find their religion a source of great strength and comfort and psychiatrists need to be aware of the importance of this, whatever their own religious beliefs might be. So what do service users want psychiatrists to do about this? Well, even service users with no religious beliefs at all are calling for a spiritual dimension to mental health care. The inevitable losses involved with any mental illness leads to pointlessness and despair. True recovery cannot take place until meaning and purpose and hope in life are restored. A healthy sense of spirituality is a huge help for this. What service users want from psychiatrists is for their religious and spiritual needs in the broader sense to be acknowledged, valued and assessed, and plans made for these needs to be met. This could involve talking with a chaplain of the appropriate faith or meeting with significant others according to the wishes of the individual. A desire for spiritual well-being 
is something that unites the vast majority of service users. What relevance does the special interest group have to the general public? I'm finding that the general public and service users are starting to look for answers and an approach to their mental health care that goes beyond biochemical and psychological. They're also voicing that they want to be seen as more than just you know, temporary fluctuations in personality or the way that they're behaving. And so they're looking for a much more whole person-centred model of care, which the special interest group has a really important role in terms of influencing that. And what we find is that a whole person-centred model where the spiritual is integrated with the biopsychosocial model has a less stigmatising effect and it's also far more accessible. The media can often be a source of myths around mental illness. Has this changed? So alongside my work as a psychiatrist, I also sit at the interface between faith and mental health as a Hindu priest, but I also present a weekly mental health radio show with the BBC. And what I've found, especially in the last few years, the media's become far more receptive to reporting mental health issues, but in a more, uh, I guess, accurate and sensitive way. They're also looking to report uh, issues where they go beyond just looking at the diagnosis of the person concerned. What I find particularly helpful about the special interest group is that it acts as a really good resource in terms of finding a balance and integration between the different models of identity that we have, whether that's biological, medical, spiritual or social. What teaching is there on spirituality and mental health? It's recommended in the position statement of the Royal College of Psychiatrists on Spirituality and Religion that psychiatrists in training should receive teaching on spirituality and religion in clinical practice and uh, local training schemes for uh, young psychiatrists include this in their curriculum, some more than others. We also have two training days a year here at the Royal College as a part of the programme of the Spirituality and Psychiatry Special Interest Group. And what research is going on into spirituality and mental health? There's um, some very interesting research going on at the moment, although it has to be said in uh, a relatively few centres around the world. And probably Durham University, North Carolina is best known, uh, particularly the work of Professor Harold Koenig there. But we also have uh, a research programme on spirituality, theology and health at Durham University in the UK. And um, there are a number of other centres in the UK where research is going on, uh, for example, with spirituality and nursing. Um, and, and other topics. At Durham, uh, one of the projects we ha have underway at the moment is on the phenomenon of voice hearing. Um, there's a big welcome funded project called Hearing the Voice, within which one of the areas of interest is spirituality and religion. And we're trying to understand how people um, experience voices as a spiritual or religious phenomenon. Do they hear God speaking to them, for example? How do they interpret the voice? What does it mean for them in terms of their spiritual or religious faith? You have two different jobs and roles. Can you tell us how they fit into your week? So, um, during the week, I'm both a consultant in liaison psychiatry and I'm an ordained priest in the Church of England. So on a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, you'd find me in church running uh, services, listening to people, counselling, writing things and going to conferences. And then on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'm a consultant psychiatrist in liaison at a small hospital in Hereford. Do you wear a dog collar around the hospital? I think most people in the hospital, most patients, wouldn't have any idea that I'm an ordained Christian minister. It's not something that comes up with most of my patients. Most of my colleagues know, but I choose not to wear a dog collar in the hospital because as a liaison consultant, I'm only seeing people once or twice as patients, and it would just cause confusion. I'd probably spend as long explaining that I'm not the chaplain as I do seeing the patients so I don't wear it in the hospital. But of course, I never stop being a priest and I never stop being a doctor. Both of those roles are vocational, they're not something that you can turn off and on. So both of them are active at all times and inform each other all the time. Do you ever pray with your patients? Well, 
I pray alongside patients and therefore with because my patients can be members of my church community. Although I've chosen to work in a different area as priest to where I work as, as doctor, one in Herefordshire, one in Worcestershire, so it's less likely to come up. What I think you're probably really asking is, do I sit down and undertake intercessory prayer with patients, asking God to make them better? And no, I don't do that when I'm in my role as a doctor. I feel because of the power imbalances, that would not be appropriate. So we've heard something about how the group has developed. Where are we up to now? The special interest group has come a long way in the last 15 years. I'm very pleased at the way we've explored a whole range of different topics. We've looked at the nature of consciousness, we've looked at evil, we've looked at prayer, we've looked at meditation, we've looked at how spirituality um, affects different mental illnesses, the relationship between spirituality and mental illness. We've not been afraid to tackle controversial or difficult topics. One of the things I've been particularly pleased about is the way we've worked together as an executive steering group. We have people from a whole range of different backgrounds, from different religious traditions or no religious tradition, from theistic backgrounds or from not atheistic background. And yet we've been able to work together very well, um, creating these different programmes to give psychiatrists an opportunity to think about and debate the whole area of spirituality. One of the things I like about the special interest group is that it is a space in which psychiatrists can think about and debate spirituality and its relationship to mental illness in an unfettered um, and thoughtful way. We've produced a position statement for the Royal College of Psychiatrists on spirituality. We've produced a book on spirituality and we've got another book coming out shortly. The Spirituality Special Interest Group is one of the most popular special interest groups in the college with over 3,000 members. I think it offers the college a unique opportunity to help work alongside service users, but also alongside people from religious and spiritual groupings who can be important allies in the treatment of our patients. And so in that way, I think we can really add value in terms of helping our patients more fully.